there's no better way to set the tongue uh, for Christmas, especially on Christmas Eve, than to read uh, Luke's account of uh, the registering of Jesus for the census. It says, uh, in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken in all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was the governor in Syria. And everyone was uh, on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. Uh, he did this, it says, in, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with, was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths. She laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Name of the child? Jesus. Jesus. Who was he? He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He had many names. We could probably go around the noon. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He was uh, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the door, the resurrection, and the life. He's many things, many names. But at the top of that list are probably two names, Messiah, King, Savior. It was all those things. Uh, according to Daniel chapter 2, verses 40 to 45, one day one would come, the divine one would come, the Messiah, the anointed one would come uh, and strike at the feet of all the false empires of the world. He would strike the, the giant image that he uh, is given from God there to represent all the final empires before the Messiah would come. He would come do that. He would destroy uh, the power of the statist Rome uh, and how it had impacted the world. And so they're lying in the major that evening, uh, out back in a stable of all places, uh, was the true king come to deal with the false king, Caesar, Augustus. Sure, his parents had some interesting conversations as they were in that little stable listening to all the cattles doing, doing what, what do cows do anyway? They, they moo, yeah. Uh, they make all kinds of noise. And the goats, I won't ask you what kind of noise they make, but they're just making all kinds of noise. And I'm sure the parents had some interesting discussions that they're lying in that little trough and the, the manger in a Jewish uh, society. You can see them if you go with us to Israel. They are uh, a stone trough, uh, probably three feet uh, uh, in diameter and probably three feet high. And they're carved out a trough for the animals. They probably laid Jesus in, a, in a, a trough like that, a manger. That's their version of a manger, not the Western concept of a little wooden box, as it were. But in that manger was the Lord of glory himself, the long-awaited Messiah, the King, born when Caesar Augustus was the most powerful leader on the face of the world. The Davidic king was born. When you look at uh, Jesus, uh, the ultimate stone that would strike at the feet of uh, Caesar Augustus, it's kind of interesting. He was born in a no-name place, Bethlehem, uh, and uh, no-name parents, Mary and Joseph. Uh, and that was the Lord of glory in that little, that little manger. It's amazing to think. Uh, strange are the ways of God. Uh, are they not? You, you cannot figure God out half the time. Uh, when he wants to bring his son to be our savior, to be the king, he does it in a very unorthodox fashion, but at a time when there's a most powerful king, Caesar. And I think a, a very interesting thing to do for uh, East, uh, not Easter, uh, uh, this is, I've preached seven times in the last couple of days, so after a while, um, this is Christmas. Uh, is, is to look at a tale of two kings, uh, the false king and a true king. The false king would be Caesar Augustus, and the true king would be Christ. Uh, and to set the tone for this, it's probably good to look at the false king first uh, and then pivot from him to the true king. So, a little bit of a history lesson. I know you love history. I know you love grammar, right? Amen? Yes. You're the evening crowd. You love these things. Caesar Augustus, that was not his name. Uh, his given name when he was born was Gaius Octavius, born September... Uh, the, the 23rd of 63. And we're talking, not 1963, we're talking way back, 63. Uh, he was born to an equestrian branch of a very influential Octavi family. Uh, when Julius uh, Caesar was executed, that was his great uncle, uh, it was in the, in the will that uh, upon his death, uh, Gaius Octavius would become the heir uh, to the throne of Julius Caesar. That happened when he was 18 years old. You can imagine handing your 18-year-old you're already shaking your head. I haven't even said what I was going to say, but can you imagine handing your 18-year-old kid who thinks they're invincible and hasn't learned a whole lot of things about life, the most powerful army in all the world, the Roman army, that was handed to him. It's amazing. He was full of ambition. He was full of pride. Uh, and he used both of those things to consolidate his power base to expand his kingdom instantly. 
He was 18 years old. Uh, there was an aged uh, Roman senator, his name, Cicero. He came to the, the young uh, Caesar, the king, and told him it would probably be a good idea to uh, deal with Mark Antony and uh, to use the, the soldiers at your disposal to accomplish that purpose. And at first, uh, uh, Octavius, Caesar, Augustus, uh, agreed with that idea, but then he quickly changed his mind and deceived Cicero, uh, made friends with Antony and Marcus Lepidus, and formed the, what was called the second triumvirate, or the, what we probably call in English circles, the three-man directorate, or something like that. He eventually took out his two friends. What a nice guy Caesar Augustus was. He took out um, Lepidus in 36 BC, and he took out uh, Mark Antony at the Battle of uh, Actium in 31 BC. And he consolidated all of his power. He was the sole powerful ruler. He went back to Rome in 27 BC and he arranged with the Roman Senate who was afraid of him because he had the Roman army behind him. He came to the Senate and made a deal with them that he wanted to make it look like he was uh, divesting himself of all of his power. And that he was just wanting to project the image of humility and meekness when that was really not who he was. And that he was going to come to them and tell them that he wanted to divest himself of all of his power. They would then say, no, we can't do that to you. We'll gladly take you as the leader. And then he would project meekness and holiness. Amazing. That's exactly what happened in January of 27 of BC. Uh, they uh, took him as the ultimate leader and they began to bequeath titles to him. Interesting titles. First title, princeps, meaning you... Gaius Octavius, are the principal Roman citizen. Of all citizens in the whole empire, you're numero uno. I don't know if that's Italian. It's probably a little Spanish, but you can get the picture. Numero eins or something. Uh, they also told him, we want to change your name, uh, not to Gaius Octavius. We want to change it to Augustus, meaning, in the Latin, the venerated one, the one to be worshipped. Can you imagine if you took your 18-year-old son, gave him the most powerful army in all the world, and said, we're going to change your name to the venerated one. I'm sure they're sitting there right now saying, yeah, mom, go for it. No, but that's what they did, Augustus, the venerated one. They weren't through. They continued to bequeath titles upon him. They gave him another one that stuck for 200 years with other Roman leaders. Imperator. Sounds like emperor. He became the first Roman emperor, the first totalitarian despotic leader over the empire uh, who ruled with an iron fist. And boy, did he. He uh, also gladly uh, took the name Caesar uh, to link himself with Julius Caesar to consolidate his power with all those who supported Julius Caesar. And then he took another name that is most interesting from a theological perspective. He took the name Imperator Caesar Divi Filius, meaning, well, Emperor Caesar, the divine son of God. Mind-boggling. Emperor worship began in his day and time. This is a picture um, of, a, of, a, of a statue of Caesar Augustus, uh, captures him uh, in his 20s, and all of his statues capture him in his 20s, because what middle-aged guy wants a statue carved in stone with you looking like you do in your 50s? No takers, right? So in pride and arrogance, every statue that was carved in his late 40s shows him in his 20s. Go figure. Here he is uh, pictured as the great Caesar, um, and I think he has on priestly robes here with the tunic over his head like that. Uh, but this was uh, situated in the city of Ephesus in what is now modern-day Turkey. Um, and wherever his, his icon was, his statue was, was where he was. And that was a place to worship the God, the son of God, Caesar. The emperor worship started with him in, great, in a great way. Uh, his emperorship, his rulership, was very brittle in many different ways. Although he projected great power to the people in a conservative poli pol political concept, uh, he was really the opposite of all the things he projected. He was a great propagandist, and he was all about deception. He was everything that a false king would be about. Uh, we'll go over a few bulletized items to bounce off these later to compare them to Christ. Here are some of the things about Caesar Augustus that are interesting. Those are just introductory thoughts to think about. Number one. Uh, his false uh, release of power to the Roman Senate on January or in January of uh, 27 BC was just a ruse to mislead the people, to give him the impression that he was meek and humble when he truly was the opposite of that. He craved power. Secondly, which I find out most interesting, I thought this next point was only found in the 60s, 1960s. Uh, he wore high-soled shoes, elevator shoes. Did you hear me? And if you have these on right now, I mean no offense, but... Uh, what do you, I'm sorry, you know, oh, okay, all right, just start pointing people out that have them on. Just tell me who they are right now. But 
Why in the world would a dictator want to wear elevator shoes? Pretty simple to figure that out. If you're not a very tall warrior or king and other Roman men are taller than you, then you want some special shoes to make yourself look a little bit taller. He did that. Again, he had the deceptive appearance of being taller when he wasn't. The third thing about him that I find interesting uh, about his false kingship uh, is stone statues, as I told you, showcase him in the prime of life. They all do. Uh, here is one as a case in point. It's a very famous one. Augustus of uh, Prima Porta is the name of this particular one. Perhaps you encountered that years ago when you were in the university studying and you've, you're continuing to study in the Roman Empire. You have this in your mind. What in the world is that about? Well, it's really interesting. They cop the Roman sculptors uh, copied this from the Greeks. They stole it. Uh, they took a sculpture uh, by a Grecian sculptor named uh, Polykleitos, uh, who carved uh, Dori Horos, uh, and it pictured a, a Grecian uh, athlete of the Grecian games in tip-top shape, you know, perfect physique, six-pack and all. And the Romans liked that age of, the, of the, the, the power of Greece, and they took it and they applied that to Caesar, and they said, we'll just uh, change the head on the body, and we'll... Art is funny at times, I suppose, but they're going to give it a different head, but a similar type of Grecian body with all the strength and power, with the arm outstretched, speaking to the troops of how great and powerful he is and eloquent his, his words were. They're going to put a breastplate on him, and if you study the brace, breastplate, which I submit to you do sometimes, it's most interesting, all on the breastplate or the Grecian, or not the Grecian, the, uh, the Roman gods are all over the breastplate showing that he, as the son of the divine one, is also supported by all the gods of the pantheon. Amazing. Toga drape, drip, draped around his waist to show that he is a, one who identifies with the people. And at his feet, you see a little, a little boy. See the little boy? That's Cupid. Who is Cupid? The last service didn't know. It was quite tragic. I, I said I would do marital counseling, but, uh, you know, I haven't, no one's called me yet. Cupid being... God of love. love, related to his mother who was the goddess of love. Uh, and uh, because he's down at his feet because he's looking up at the massive nature of the divine one, which is then tying him to divinity because he's related to Cupid. Amazing. The dolphin that Cupid is riding upon uh, commemorates his battle in destroying Mark Antony and Cleopatra in 31 BC, commemorating the fact that he is the ultimate ruler. Another thing about him that is most interesting and deceptive is this particular uh, stone statue that uh, you will see if you study his life. Uh, this presents uh, Augustus not as king, but as high priest. Uh, he was called the Pontifex Maximus, or the high priest of the College of Pontiffs of their polytheistic system back in the day. Pontifex meaning the bridge builder, Maximus meaning the greatest. Waiting those two words together, you can figure out the meaning the great bridge builder. You have to ask, what are they building a bridge to? Well, between God and man. He was saying that he is the ultimate high priest, the ultimate bridge builder between God and man. And in one year, he boasts that he built 82 temples to the Roman pantheon. What a holy man he was. And lastly, the other deceptive thing about his nature was he was great to articulate all kinds of new laws. He put lots of new laws on the books, telling people how to live. He had a lot of marriage laws to make marriage a wonderful, virtuous thing. The only problem was if you want to wade through Suetonius's uh, The Twelve Caesars, uh, the Roman historian from 69 AD, which I was reading the chapter on Caesar Augustus the other night, about 10 o'clock. I wouldn't suggest doing that. But I read it, and I've read it before. And I reread it, and I came across this interesting statement from Suetonius, who said this about Caesar. It says, not even his friends could deny that he often committed adultery. Though, of course, they said in justification that he did it for reasons of state, not passion. <laughs> Deception. To read him is to read plethora of laws about how to make marriage great. And on the other hand, he can't be true to one woman. Amazing. All about deception. He's the false king the king who created the census for Mary and Joseph to attend to. Jesus is the opposite of the false king. He's the true king because he's the antithesis of the things that we just mentioned. Number one, Christ comes as the essence of truth. John chapter one, verse 14. John, who spent much time with Christ, writes this. It says the word, speaking of Jesus, and that's the Greek word logos, which means he's the great logical one, which means it's a Christian is the one with the thinking mind not the crazy person. 
He's the great logical one. He became flesh. Uh, and he dwelt among us, and we, John says, we saw his glory. He says, the glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, I, I remember the day when me and Peter and James went up to the holy mountain, and Jesus showed us his Shekinah glory, and we were blinded by it, and we hit the ground and worshiped in his presence. He said, he, he came, and he was full of two things. What two things? Grace for sinners and truth. Truth. He was the essence of truth. He was everything Caesar Augustus was not. John chapter 14, Jesus speaking to the disciples, they asked them all kinds of questions. In answer to some of their questions about who he is, he offers this, and most Christians know how to quote this, even though you didn't memorize it. Jesus said to the disciples, hey guys, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Then he says, if you want to get into heaven, well, no one comes to the Father but through me. That's the narrowness of the gospel. Jesus says, I am the only way, and I am the essence of truth, and all, all life springs from me, physical life and eternal life. He said, I am the essence of truth. Uh, the articles that are used there before those descriptions of Christ, the article being the word the, can be classified in a variety of ways in the Greek language. Um, one of them is the monadic use of the article, meaning it's the one and only, there's no other one. It could also be classified grammatically as uh, the use of the article in a par, par excellence form of the word, meaning there's none better and greater than he in any one of those capacities. He was the essence of truth. When they tried to uh, uh, arrest Jesus and, and, and conjure up uh, charges to, for, you know, to, to crucify him, they were hard-pressed to find anything about him. Why? He only ever spoke truth. Matthew 26, 60 says they finally conscripted some, um, well, some baser individuals to lie in order to get him uh, executed. Caesar played fast and loose with politics and didn't tell the truth all the time, and Jesus only ever spoke the truth. Jesus was also uh, the eternal God, born by the, the will of the Father. Uh, in the city of David, the great king, as prophesied 800 years before he became a Christian, or before he became the Christ in Bethlehem. It says in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, written around 800 B.C., there, give or take a few years. It says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, which is the Hebrew word for fruitful, Bethlehem meaning bait and lechem, the house of bread, which is ironic because the Lord who's the bread of life was born in the house of bread, and boy, was he fruitful and spiritual, giving spiritual life, but... He says uh, in the ancient prophecy, too, too little to be among the clans of Judah is Bethlehem, for from you will, one will go forth from me, God says, to be the ruler in Israel. Who is he, this one that's coming to be the ultimate king? Well, God says through the prophet Micah, his goings forth are from long ago. How long ago? Well, from the days of eternity. Uh, I just went in my office now between services because I had a few minutes to kind of relax and I open my Hebrew Bible to read that one more time just to verify the fact of what it says there. That last little phrase there, from the days of eternity, it's the strongest way in Hebrew to say he's eternal. Who, who was coming to be born in Bethlehem? God was going to leave the glory of home and become the God man. That's who Jesus was. He was everything Caesar wasn't. Caesar claimed to be divine. Jesus illustrated his greatness in being born at the right time in the right city by the will of the Father. And he wasn't just going to be the great king. He was going to become the, the great priest, as we're going to see. The chief priest in Israel, when Christ was born, um, helped Herod with his fear, because Herod, Herod was all about consolidation of power, as Caesar was. When Herod heard that the Messiah had been born, he was not excited about any competition to his throne. So as it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, when Herod the king heard this, that this Messiah was born, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief, chief priests, these were the Jewish chief priests, the scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And it's interesting, it says, they said to him immediately where that was to take place. They said, well, no, in Bethlehem, you know, in Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And they quote Micah 5 too. They knew exactly where the Messiah was going to come. They just didn't recognize him when he came. Caesar strove in his time to be the great eternal God, but only Jesus was the eternal one born, according to Micah 5, 2, as the great eternal God that hit the planet to save us from our sins. Uh, Caesar also, additionally, as we saw, uh, tried to strive to, uh, to impress everybody with the fact that he was the son of the divine. He was the son of God, but he was just a mere mortal man. 
and capable of defeating death as Jesus did. Jesus, on the other hand, uh, was born like no man was ever born. Virgin birth demonstrates his divinity. In the book of Mark, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, it talks about Jesus, these words. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening up above his head, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, descending like a dove, descending up upon him. And then a voice came out of the heavens, the Father speaking to the Son while he standing in the water of the Jordan River. You're my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Why was the Father pleased? Well, the Son left the glory of heaven to go to Bethlehem, to be born in a no-name place, to grow to become the God-man who would go to the cross for each of us. God says, I'm well pleased in you, son. Heaven's never opened for Caesar. The Father never spoke from heaven to Caesar, but he did to Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus was also more than Herod, uh, Herod and, and Caesar combined. Uh, Herod, and, uh, always, he strove to try to be the king of the Jews. Caesar tried to be the, the king of all kings and the God of all gods. But when you look at Jesus, uh, he was the true king, and he was the priest of all priests. Matthew uh, chapter 1 uh, take, takes his genealogy all the way back to David, King David, because he was from the line of David. And the book of Hebrews uh, ties his priesthood to the eternal order of priests called Melchizedek. Here's what we read in chapter 5. It says, In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. This is, you can almost sense Christ's struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as the high priest after order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek being the priest that Abraham paid tithes to before Aaron. See, Jesus was the greater high priest. He was the greatest high priest. Something that Caesar Augustus could never attain to. Paul, the great rabbi, when he became a believer, wrote in one of, near the end of his life in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, these definitive words. He says to Timothy, the pastor, hey, don't ever forget there's one God and one mediator between God and man. He says that's the Messiah Christ, Jesus. And how did he become that? Well, he gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Who's the ultimate bridge builder between God and man? Not Caesar, it's Jesus. When I was uh, growing up, my parents uh, enrolled me in Cub Scouts, I don't know, and then Weeblos, and then Boy Scouts. And that's, I did that all my life until I went to college. I had a lot of fun. Uh, one day when I was in uh, Boy Scouts, uh, we went out to the desert where I grew up in the Imperial Valley of Southern California. I went to a place called Dos Cabezos. Uh, I think it's Spanish for the two heads. And there was a canyon there. And we were about 12 at the time. And they told us, we wanted you guys to take all this rope this weekend and build a rope bridge across that canyon. We were 12. Would you cross that bridge? Yeah, I remember the day that bridge was constructed. Rope was to infinity. And I don't know how many Boy Scouts were you know, among us. You might understand this. Nobody? One or two? You know, triple half hitch, double half hitch, you know, square knots. These are important things. And so we, we took all those things to task and, and used all those different knots to build that bridge. You know, the, the mineral, middle rope going down the middle with the two that you hold on to and you weave it together. And we, man, there was an untold amount of guys from different troops built that bridge. That's when you go pick your, your best friend and send him out first. Hey, Larry, why don't you go test the bridge out, you know? But we, we, we went across that bridge all weekend. It was great. It was the only way to get from one side to the other was that little bridge we made. You know, when you look at uh, that same thing from a spiritual perspective, I mean, who's built the ultimate bridge between man and God? And it's not a rickety bridge. It's a powerful bridge. Well, that'd be Christ. See, Caesar Augustus said that he's the ultimate pontifex maximus, but Jesus said, no, I'm the greatest bridge builder. I have to ask you a question this uh, Christmas Eve. It's a simple one. It's a logic one. Is Christ your bridge builder? Have you walked across him in faith into glory? He waits to accept you across him as the bridge. The last thing about old Caesar Augustus and Jesus, and I close with this, uh, Caesar waxed eloquent on the fact that with his great power over the military and the economy and everything, he had created what was called the Pax Romana or Roman peace. The only problem is if you study Roman history, it didn't last forever. It was only temporal, Pax Romana. 
Jesus is the only one that can bring true peace, lasting peace. He brings peace as the coming king, and he brings peace as the savior. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 is typically read at Christmas by many Christians, and we'll review it quickly. The ancient prophecy from the pen of uh, Isaiah, contemporary of Micah, says, For a child will be born, a son will be given to us, and the government, speaking of the Davidic government, as prophesied in 2 Samuel 7, will rest on his shoulders and his name. What's his name? Wonderful Counselor. Who's that going to be? Oh, it's going to be called the mighty who? Jehovah God. He's God. Who's that exactly? Oh, he's the Eternal Father. Oh, he's the Prince of Peace. God's going to be born. It says, there will be no end to the increase of his government of peace and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it. What kind of kingdom will it be? Well, not like Caesar's. His will be known for justice and righteousness. And from then on and forevermore, it says this will happen in the zeal of the Lord of hosts. It will accomplish this. Translated, you will not be able to stop God establishing his kingdom. We as Christians uh, typically pray the Lord's Prayer. You know it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next words. Thy kingdom come. Why are we praying that? But have you looked at the world situation lately? It needs the king. Isaiah says he's coming. And when he comes, he creates an empire known for peace and righteousness. But now he's the great God who creates the ultimate peace, spiritually speaking. Paul writes it, and I close with this. Colossians 1.19. Paul says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, meaning the fullness of deity. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace. How did Jesus make peace between God and a sinner? Well, that little preposition through tells you how he did it. He did it through the blood of his cross. And through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, the only way that man who's sinful can find peace with the living God is through that little babe born out back in a stable to Mary and Joseph. He wasn't any ordinary baby. Well, that was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior, Jesus. We as Christian, Christians uh, say Merry Christmas, and it should have a lot of meaning to you. Does a lot, does to me. It's Merry because of, of a couple of things. Number one, Christ was born. Number two, the King of Kings was born. And number three, well, my Savior was born. Hopefully, He's your Savior. Merry Christmas to you.